Asalaamu As Alaikum and welcome to another interview for our Public Quran campaign, My Chosen Verse series. Today we have joining us Dr. Kevin Barrett, who is a PhD Arabist Islamologist and one of America's best known critics of the war on terror. He hosts the Truth Jihad radio on the online platform patreon.com and also the False Flag Weekly News podcast and has appeared many times on Fox, CNN, PBS and other broadcast outlets. Dr. Barrett has taught in, at colleges and universities in San Francisco, Paris and Wisconsin, where he ran for Congress in 2008. He currently works as a non-profit organizer, author and talk radio host. So welcome to the Public Run campaign. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you and I commend what you're doing. It's a great project. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, so um, without any further um, ado, we'll just go straight in. What verse have you chosen? Tell us about what your reflections are. Well, it was a hard choice because there, there are so many uh, really insightful verses that have made me stop and take notes while I recite Quran. But I, I chose Surat al-Hadid's verse 20. And I'll go ahead and read it to you. And I'm, I'm not a, a very skilled reciter, but at least I can get it across. And a slightly adjusted translation of that from Muhammad Assad reads, Know that the life of this world is but a play and a passing delight and a beautiful show and a cause of your boastful vying with one another and your greed for more and more riches and children. Its parable is that of life giving rain. The herbage which it causes to grow delights the tillers of the soil, but then it withers and you can see it turn yellow. And in the end, it crumbles into dust. But uh, the life to come, or the abiding truth of man's condition, will become fully apparent in the life to come, either severe suffering or God's forgiveness and his goodly acceptance. For the life of this world is nothing but an enjoyment of self-delusion. So I, I love this verse for, well, a, a number of reasons. And we should quickly say the, 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 the verse after it, uh, that's verse 21 in Surah Al-Hadid uh, begins, uh, vie with one another in seeking to attain to your sustainer's forgiveness. So this is about vying with each other or rivalry. And the rivalry in the dunya or this world for riches and children, or today would probably be riches and sexuality because we've divorced sexuality from children uh, in the modern materialistic secular world, uh, this rivalry is really the basis of social life in, in, in worldly social life. And in this verse, Allah tells us that that is our condition so that we can strive against it. And we should be uh, vying with each other in goodness. There are a number of verses that make that point that we should vie with each other in goodness. And I think the insight into the fact that worldly human life is basically rivalry. Uh, it's, it's a truth that we have a hard time accepting, of course. We're always repressing it because if we just admit the rivalry that we're in with our neighbors and with others, we end up in the war of all against all and we start hating on each other and openly trying to one-up each other all the time. But this truth uh, was, was, I think, very well described by the great Christian philosopher, uh, René Girard, who said that the basis of all human social life, he said, it's a lie and a murder. And he said that this rivalry of all against all, the basis of the human condition that we're always trying to hide from ourselves uh, ends up causing us to, to de we desire what other people desire, right? We don't desire just what they have. Uh, in this case, well, the, the Quranic verse says wealth and children, but uh, we desire what they desire. That is, we see that somebody wants something and we want that. They want someone, we want that someone. And there are endless sexual comedies about this, how 
a man has no use for a woman until some other man wants her. And then suddenly he goes nuts to try to get her. Uh, so this is uh, really, uh, it's, it's, it's a hidden truth. And, and Rene Girard says that from his Christian perspective, scripture, and he mostly talks about the, the Torah and the Injil, that is the Jewish and Christian scriptures, but he, you know, the, the, he should have gotten more into the Quranic aspect. And I hope to do more work on that. That, that the, the solution from that perspective, especially the Christian perspective, is that what ha happens is everybody gets into rivalry against each other and they're ready to kill each other. And then they turn on a scapegoat and they lynch a scapegoat. They always blame somebody else. And we see the scapegoating, He's, and that's why he said the basis of social life is a lie and a murder. They murder, the, the whole society turns against some scapegoat, commits a, a lynching or a murder. And then they're so horrified by what they've done that they sort of repress it and lie about it. And then the next year they put up a statue or an idol uh, honoring the victim of their murder who becomes their cynical. deity <laughs> well you could say that but but this he described this as the basis of pagan religion that's what pagan religion is that that's precisely why there were those gods those pagan gods in the temple of mecca and why there are statues of pagan gods in other pagan religions because what they are that's what their memory of an ancient lynching says gerard and i think he's right uh and, and so monotheism comes along and basically gets us uh raises up us above that now, of course, all of these other cultures that are quote unquote not monotheistic, they have their own version of monotheism. They've been in cycles. All cultures are in cycles of monotheism and, and polytheism or, or shirk. But uh, in, in any case, so that, that, that murder, that lynching, uh, that sacrifice becomes the basis of, uh, of the social cohesion. Everybody remembers, represses, and lies about the fact that they just murdered somebody. And I think, uh, parenthetically, uh, today's um, uh, West ought to think about the fact that they uh, did a, a big lie on 9-11 and murdered uh, 27 million Muslims, <laughs> according to Gideon Paglia's count, a uh, classic case of, of, of scapegoating, according to Rene Girard. But anyway, this Quranic verse that uh, discusses this, this problem, that, that rivalry is, is the basis of, of our life in this dunya, reminds us that that's all passing and an old person who looks back on their life and sees they were in constant rivalries for wealth and sex and power and comfort and social status and all those things and then as death approaches they're going to realize they wasted their life and if they they didn't do enough good when they die and step off into eternity they're going to be facing immense suffering and this is the, the cosmic truth here that's being told in in this verse and so finally, I'll, I'll just finish this, this uh, first analysis by saying that the Islamic solution to this problem of rivalry is not like, you know, in, in Gerard's Christian solution was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, which is Jesus being nailed on the cross and dying for everybody's sins. And somehow that makes everybody love each other. So that's maybe it, it's worked for a few people, but it, I don't know if it's saved the world yet. Uh, that's what Girard thought the solution was uh, to this problem. But in Islam, uh, our solution is to vie with each other in goodness and to, to, to do good and to have, to, to have faith or taqwa, uh, purity of heart, uh, uh, heart knowledge or, or faith. We have that taqwa and then we do good works. Uh, aminu aminu salihati. And we do that uh, consciously creating a society and a, a, a social group, a neighborhood even, that, in which we're not constantly, that, that the rivalries are tempered, that we recognize that the life of this world is just a snare and a delusion. And so we're not building the fanciest looking house. You know, if you look at most Islamic countries in the neighborhoods, you know, the people have nice stuff inside their houses. The outside doesn't look real fancy because they don't want this kind of rivalry. They, they, you know, the, the, the evil eye or the ayn in many cultures uh, that I've been in, some, that's related to this too, because the evil eye of envy uh, brings bad luck. And of course it does, because envy drives all social life in a, in a demonic direction, as this verse is, is telling us. Uh, so in Islamic, the Islamic solution is to temper these rivalries. We don't want people dressing up to incite sexual desire so that the, this chain of mutual desire goes out of control and turns into fitna or chaos and leads to mass murders and scapegoating. Instead, we want 
uh, each other to, to be, be kind, uh, do good works, uh, have talk what purify our hearts and tone down these rivalries, right? And so the modern materialistic world of all out rivalry for all of the wealth, power, success, status, and all of that sort of thing, this is really hell. <laughs> and uh, the Quran is telling us this and, and, and heaven, it would be, or at least the a good life leading to paradise is uh, a world where those rivalries are tempered down and muted. And so that we're free, our hearts are free from the drives and desires of the evil that desires evil. And that's, and instead we can focus on, on doing good and focus on our ultimate destination. Uh, so uh, again, I think this, this verse sums up a whole lot of the message of the Quran and it's one that today's world really needs to attend to. Yes, it's, it reminds me of a few things. Um, one was, uh, it's not really a Quranic verse, but it's, it's a, an anecdote of uh, someone who went to study with a great sheikh. And, uh, and uh, among the students, there was a lot of rivalry about the students and they uh, wanted to be better than each other and so on and so on. And so one student was saying, has asked the teacher how he could become better than the students. And he said, by wanting them to be better than you. <laughs> that was, that's quite a nice... A yes. nice thing to, to have to sort of you want the good for everyone else is is the way to become a better person, and and if, yes. you, if you strive to, it's it's I think it's a bit like when we talk about zero sum games and things like this. We talk about you know how big's my piece of the cake, and 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 and, and we worry so much about how much we're getting of the cake. We we ignore where the cake comes from. You know who who makes the mm -hmm. cake in the first place. And, right. Right. You no. Know, do we want reparations for this, that, or the other terrible injustice that happened to us? But look, the reality is, I mean, from a basic physics point of view, our dunya, everything we get, if the sun stopped for a day, we would be in a terrible mess. You know, the, the, the risk provided from the energy from the sun and from everything we get from the environment is, is far huger than anything that we could ever provide for ourselves. You know, Allah provides for us in so many ways, and yet we worry about how much we take from each other so much. And uh, it, it really distracts us um, from, from the true realities of what's going on and, and where our true risk comes from, which is from Allah. And, and uh, he gives it out in, in, in huge measure. And, and, and I would say as a, someone who enjoys looking at the physics of it all, um, the, the amount of energy that, is coming at the earth and then disappearing out into space far dwarfs anything human beings could ever use. And that's the source of all our, our you know, uh, provision in one way or another. It provides for the, 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 the energy that grows the crops, which provides the food, it provides you know, our basic sustenance and everything else that we, we, we use in life. And, and yet we worry so much about you know, how much we may have taken from one another. If, you know, and it's not as important as that Allah provides everything. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I think Girard actually gets that because that, that uh, idea of the uh, insatiable desire, desiring other desires uh, gets at the point that w when what we desire really isn't in that sense, the, the reality, the reality, the, tr the true, uh, the, the, what we actually experience in reality and all of this provision or risk that we're given and these miracles, these ayat, these, these beautiful creations all around us, uh, are the reality, but when we fall into this this vicious cycle of desiring what the other person desires that leads to the chaos or the fitna, then we're forgetting about that reality, that risk that was given us, and that beautiful creation of the ayat that Allah has created. And so we're actually in this cycle of kind of nothingness, where we're, we're in, a, in that delusion uh, that what we want is, you know, whatever we think the other person wants, and we're not actually seeing the reality that's there. And, and, and the psychologists actually have noticed something like this, that they, they've done all sorts of experiments, giving people a bunch of, you know, hundred dollars or whatever and saying, go out and spend this on yourself. And then the other group, they say, go out and spend this on other people. And the group that goes out and does good things for other people with the money ends up happier. In the, when they come back to the experimenter and get measured. So these ha happiness science actually has found that that's true, that letting go of these rivalrous desires uh, and selfishness uh, and actually giving 
in charity uh, and reaching out and, and desiring the good of other people, as you were talking about. Actually, that's what makes people calm and happy in this life, too. I, I, it reminds me also of this, this issue of, of giving being good for us. I mean, we have the idea of zakat, and it's often that the two words uh, in, uh, is means, the word zakat has two meanings often we talk about being. It's um, to uh, purify, but also to, to grow. And it, you actually, it, it's, uh, and I think it's, it's coming from the sort of uh, plant metaphor, you know, like you have to prune the plants to help it to grow in, in, in the best way. You have to weed and remove the, 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 the other plants that get in the way. And, and if we are so precious of, of every little bit of growth we have, then it stops us growing to our full potential. And, and that I think is uh, a good, uh, another example of how it is. But I think the, the broader picture here, I think I want to focus on an interesting comment, is the idea that um, it's not that rivalry in and of itself is the problem, it's that we misuse it. And you can be rivalrous in doing good deeds and we can yes. be rivalrous in ways that, that is beneficial to society. It's when it starts becoming uh, uh, a kind of, as I said, the zero sum game where you think that your success relies on other people's failure, that then things start to go downhill quite rapidly. Um, and it's one if you if you you can when you see someone with a good thing in Islam we say mashallah mashallah may Allah you know uh, give you more of that and and we, we shouldn't be just to take away the idea of envy because envy is is, is the, the, the wanting them to have less so that you don't feel you know uh, diminished by it but we should never feel diminished if, if someone has a lot we say mashallah that's good that and wealth can be a, a trial you know a trial for someone if someone has too much wealth, then it's, 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 uh, they may misuse it. And it can go, you know, that can be a, a, a point against them on Yom Al-Qiyama, on the Day of Judgment, if they don't use their wealth well. So not being given that test, if you're not ready for it, is probably a good thing. Some people are just so focused on dunya that they, they, their lives are a misery. I mean, it was Onassis, uh, famously, who was, uh, you know, super focused on making huge amounts of money and his he had a terrible, you know, family. His wife, his children, and the people in his family committed suicide around him, and and he ended up very, you know, very unhappy altogether. And it can happen very easily. I think it probably happens uh, very often. In fact, and the, and the ruling elites in today's world are often made up of people who've been very driven and uh, very desirous and, and rivalrous and, and fought to get to the top because that's how the, the social structure is constructed uh, in, in today's world, well, to some extent in other past societies as well. But of course, the Islamic ideal would be that we should be ruled by goodness, by our own goodness, and then by the best among us as, as the, the ruler. And I think this goes a long way towards explaining what's wrong with the world, that we've set up a system where the people who want power the most end up with the power. And of course, they tend to be psychopaths. And we, what we want is saints in power, but the saint doesn't want to be in power. So you have to sort of force the saint to, <laughs> to be in charge. Yeah, I think one of the things um, that really uh, defines, I think, how, how a lot of power structures work today um, is is the, the fear of, of blackmail. And if you look into lots of the details of it, I don't want to go too much into it, but if, if people fear that, that they will be exposed and so on, it, it, it means they're open to manipulation. And one of the th biggest, suppose you could, you could go into the sort of religious dimension of it, is that if you think of it, the satanic um, control of people is largely around the idea that if you get them to do something bad, that you can then uh, expose them and ruin their life and if they think this is the only life they ever have and this, this life is ruined for them because they're exposed to having done some terrible deed uh, then uh, you have control over them and mm -hmm. it's only by saying to people look it doesn't matter how bad you think your deed is if you repent from it and if you uh, turn your life around then God will forgive you you know you have to turn, mm -hmm. turn to God and God can, can forgive any you know, sin, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, you may, other people may not like you, but your ultimate destiny is not to be judged by other people, it's to be judged by God. And I think that's, that's this right. is uh, something that uh, is, is, it takes a lot of um, kind of courage to, to 
to, to face up to that. And I think it's essentially this, this like, that's, I think, very fundamental in the way a lot of things are run. I mean, I just, just thinking recently about events and how um, I noticed in America, uh, juries are very pressured to come up with guilty verdicts for various reasons um, when the evidence just doesn't justify it. You find cases, I hear cases of people being released from prison after 34 years. When, and if you hear the evidence they convicted them on, by no means was it beyond reasonable doubt. And right. Terrible things that happen to people because of the sort of the pressure of society to find people guilty. And the same thing happened in the UK recently. I mean, not, not as recently, perhaps, in those particular cases, but I remember the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six and the various other people had so much pressure to find people guilty. In that case, they were Irish people found guilty of, of, of crimes they didn't commit by police forcing to a confessions or but this happens a lot with it there's lots of political pressure to, to get a conviction and um because we because i think fundamentally it's very hard for people to acknowledge that some crimes we can't we can't punish for because there's the evidence has been destroyed I and mean, we just don't know for sure if they did it or not and we have to leave those judgments to god otherwise we're starting to risk doing massive injustices by framing people for crimes they didn't commit or, uh, and, and I think that whole idea of when we don't, we don't know how that there's not enough evidence to convict. And we say, rather, you're not, not rather than declaring them as innocent, we say it's up to God to punish them if they're guilty. <laughs> you know, and, right. and leave it. There's a certain, uh, you have to have that level. Otherwise you end up punishing people for thoughts or, the suspicions of all sorts of things you can't prove. And that's very, very dangerous. Yes. And, and of course, that's going on in, in, in today's society uh, because it's a basically worldly society. And so they need to promote the myth that crime doesn't pay. And of course, the society is run by the worst criminals. Uh, Akbar <laughs> Mujrimin, uh, as the Quran discusses us, that Allah will allow the greatest criminals to have their run for a little while, but then they ultimately face the music. And the, so we're run by the greatest criminals, but they can't allow the masses to know that crime pays. It paid for them, but you know, there's a limit to how many people they can allow it to, to, to work for. So what they do is they, they've created this myth that criminals get caught and punished. And to some, there's some truth in it, some do, but they have to make sure that everybody, you know, almost everybody who tries to plead not guilty and go before a jury gets convicted because if they didn't, then everybody would try to go to a jury and they wouldn't plea bargain away 99.9% .9 of the cases and save the taxpayers money. They don't have enough money to put everybody in front of a jury. So they've created this system that basically just that once, once their people were charged, they're guaranteed to be found guilty no matter how slight the evidence is, giving the prosecutors total control. So that, that's one of the downsides of many downsides of living in a basically materialistic and secular society. But you're right that uh, ultimately we, we can't punish all crimes. Ultimately, Allah uh, is the one who punishes and rewards. And it's interesting that the, the verse right after the one that I, I read uh, begins, uh, vie with one another in seeking to attain your sustainer's forgiveness and thus to a paradise as vast as the heavens and the earth. So that uh, vying for, uh, for forgiveness, vying to, for God's forgiveness by, by genuinely repenting and having talba and then doing good opens up to a paradise as vast as the heavens and the earth, which, which is the real, uh, the, the riches that Allah has given us, the risk that you mentioned and, and the ayat, the, the beautiful signs of God all around us, uh, that's as vast as the heavens and the earth. And then we vie with each other for selfish purposes, trying to get these little trinkets to give us social status and so on. Uh, we're, we're narrowing ourselves and ultimately heading for, for hellfire. Um, and, and, so it, as, as you said, the, the issue of, uh, of, of God's forgiveness for sins and the people who've, who've cr committed crimes and sins, including these, these psychopaths in power, uh, if they genuinely can repent, uh, they have a chance of forgiveness. I have a you know, Christian friend who said, well, you know, you, I feel sorry for you Muslims because, you know, we Christians are guaranteed God's forgiveness for all of our sins because Jesus died for us. 
And so we have that, you know, we know we're terrible sinners, but we have that that we can cling to. But you poor Muslims, you guys, you know, you have to actually do good <laughs> to get your reward. <laughs> and you're going you're to get punished for your sins. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, <laughs> if it does that first, doesn't that make a little more sense than your point of view? And then secondly, uh, there's always hope for, for God's forgiveness in Islam. And this I, uh, basically is telling so, uh, vie with each other, seeking your sustainer's forgiveness, and thus a paradise as vast as the heavens of the earth. There's always that hope for, for God's forgiveness uh, right up till very, very close to the end. And, and so our, our sinfulness is, is not this, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily per condemn us forever, no matter what we've done. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's, that's various ways that have described in, in, in the Quran. I think it says quite clearly that you're a lot multiplies the rewards of those who do good but for them mm -hmm. uh, account for exactly you know you have to, to pay the penalty just for the things you've done bad that he will forgive as well even without reckoning so there's so mm -hmm. so many ways that, that uh, Allah's mercy is bigger there's a I often refer people Christians who, who have this discussion with to um, the, the parable of the vineyard keeper who, who uh, there's a, a whole long story in, in the Bible which I think was uh, were the most authentic uh, words of Christ according to some, one Bible that was kind of like trying to identify what's authentic and what's made up. I think. Um, but it was was a, it's a long parable. Uh, uh, but it basically is the gist of it is that God is merciful by being generous by multiplying rewards of people who who, who do good and he doesn't. And in that particular case, it's like you know if someone just turns to God uh, very late on in their life. And they've done all sorts of bad. They are judged according to how uh, they're, they're given. Their, their rewards are more multiplied because they didn't. They maybe just didn't get the information until a certain point. So that it's how you behave once you get the information, once you once that revelation, once that message reaches you. If you accept it and you turn in repentance, uh, even if it's a short while, that that's what God thinks. You know, God is multiply that reward so it's not that he's he's counting every good deed you know in quite the same way as you might count it uh, but he will multiply those deeds for those who have less opportunity so that it's fair that everyone uh you know can can get uh, a good reward from, from God. yes and, and allah's justice is central to this quranic worldview that we're living in an ultimately just universe uh created by an ultimately just creator and this really uh, challenges a lot of uh, contemporary Western thinkers who have gone on the sort of atheist and existentialist bandwagon. And, but they're ultimately uh, facing the, the problem of evil. And, you know, how can there be evil uh, in a world created by a just God? And that's been one of the biggest, if not the biggest impediments to religion and, and uh, encouragements to people moving away from religion in, in the last couple of centuries in the, in the West. And, you know, in Islam, we see that God's justice uh, is, is absolute and complete, but perhaps we don't always see all of it. And there are all sorts of examples of that with the, uh, when Sayyidina al-Khadir or the Green Man uh, and Moses are, are together and, and the Green Man uh, al-Khadir commits what appear to be terrible sins and crimes, but it turns out they were for the best. Moses, even this great prophet, the prophet I believe most mentioned of all the prophets in the Quran, couldn't see the reality. And so we always have a partial view of things and we, we're not going to see the justice of everything. We're gonna see a lot of apparent injustice. Uh, but knowing what we know that this world isn't everything and that there is a, an akhira, a next world, and, and there's the, the alam al raib the unseen world, and uh, that ultimately what we're, we're vying for each other in goodness in a spiritual dimension of things, that the apparent uh, evils of the dunya or, or this world, the material uh, space-time continuum actually uh, are somehow justified in, in this uh, spiritual world. And this of course sounds to, it sounds like a fairy tale to some sort of atheist materialist types, but actually, the, the science is sort of starting to catch up to a little bit of this, at least in terms of verifying the reality of a spiritual world and the fact that consciousness is the baseline reality, not uh, not matter. Uh, 
and you, I guess you're interested in physics, so you probably follow some of this stuff. That, that you know, with quantum physics, consciousness plays a role in the cre actual creation of reality out of nothingness, and you know, God or Allah would be the ultimate consciousness. So the, the fact that the world has all of these unseen dimensions and it's based on consciousness and meaning, not on just meaningless matter, uh, helps us understand how the apparent injustice in this material world actually might not be the end of the story. And indeed, the Quran assures us that it is not. I think that the, the, the humility of the believer in believing the unseen and, and, and knowing that there is more to existence than we can perceive, and that uh, that is a, a, a fundamental uh, part of, of a believer's life, is that humility and, and to recognize that there is, that we shouldn't say that because I've seen this and that's the end of it, that that's, I know everything kind of attitude and mm -hmm. sort of throwing one's hands up in the air and saying that there is no purpose and there is no justice and, and 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 you end up this nihilistic uh but very arrogant assertion that you, yes. you really understand the world when when you, you we really don't and we are it's only people who who are at the edge of sort of asking questions about the nature of reality and in, in physics and so on where you you start to realize how little you do know i remember uh in my in my final year of my degree in physics some years ago many years ago um they were describing how that the only uh, thing we can actually calculate analytically is the is the hydrogen atom, and everything else is 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 too is the maths is just not really solvable, uh, and and so it's like well hang on a minute, <laughs> we, feel, we think we know so much, but it's all kind of approximations and models and and statistical models and things, but it's there's a lot, and and that's and that's already a complicated that's already an approximation in any case because uh, the proton is made of multiple parts as well. And, and so how, how we, uh, uh, we can't, there's not, there isn't that precise even then. But there's, there's we, the humility I think is, is an important point about that. And the, the, I, I kind of, I think a lot about the, um, the way, um, uh, the sort of the, 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 the basis of belief essentially, it's not a rational argument in the sense that you, it, you to be rational itself is immoral. <laughs> you know, to, to actually, to, to, to think you have an obligation to be sincere, to have an obligation to be uh, truthful, to have an obligation to have any kind of uh, sense of, I should be reasonable, is immoral. And you don't get that without thinking you're gonna be accountable and that there is gonna be justice. And if you live a life where you're, you know, just moral free and do what you like, then there is, uh, it's, there's no persuading you you should be reasonable or should be rational or anything so morality itself is a foundation for rationality and not the other way around and you can't really get to a rational explanation of morals uh if you if you ignore the the possibility of, of punishment or reward after death because you, you, people can perfectly well rationalize the most evil behavior possible um if they don't believe that they'll be held to account after they die Yes, and, and they do all the time, of course. Um, okay, thanks very much. I think uh, we'll, we'll draw it to a close there. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, Likewise. Happy your, uh, may you have make some, make much success in your mission to uh, bring truth around the world in all, all, uh, to, to help people get through, their, get through the big lies that they have deluded themselves with. And hopefully uh, uh, more and more people will wake up to the truth of... Uh, God's message in the Quran and, uh, and uh, our ultimate destiny with him, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Laman. It's been great.